Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. Does the pressure of the environment have an impact or not? In today's installment of the story, we'll find out. Enjoy the story. Damn it, Cheryl. You've been working with us for four months, Connie said. This is the first time we've made you come out with us, so don't even think about leaving until you've had at least one cocktail and you'll dance at least a couple of times. Today is Friday. There will be a lot of guys here, and you're a beautiful woman. There won't be any problem finding someone. One drink, and I'm leaving, Cheryl replied. No dancing and no men, Cheryl stated. Not that it matters, Helen said, but are you, by any chance, into girls? Of course not, Cheryl replied. Her new colleagues could not understand her, only Connie knew the truth about Cheryl's life before she came to work at Z's company. Cheryl was an attractive brunette, about 5 feet 4 inches tall. She had nice but not prominent breasts, a thin waist, and a nice but not particularly noticeable fifth place. Her best features were her green eyes and long legs. Connie, on the other hand, was blonde and shorter, only 5 foot tall. She had huge breasts and a round but she was 10 to 15 pounds overweight, but everything was in place, and men adored her. Nancy, the youngest of the bunch at 30, was the tallest but had the least curves, A-cup breasts and slender, boyish hips. Helen, who was 44, was the oldest but also the only one of the four who was married and had children. Cheryl had been married for over 15 years, but unfortunately, her marriage ended just 11 months ago. She was still going through a breakup, which explained her monastic lifestyle. If you're not into girls, then why don't you want to meet a good man, asked Nancy. Because I already met one and ruined everything, Cheryl replied coldly. Besides, it's impossible to meet a good man in a place like this. Everyone you meet here are hunters for easy prey and one-night stands. No, thank you. The other women were shocked by Cheryl's words. They looked at her, waiting for her to share her story, but she remained silent. She looked around the room as if trying to find a way out, but her eyes fell on a guy at a table on the other side of the room. Nancy and Connie followed her gaze, surprised to see where she was looking. Cheryl completely forgot about her friends as she focused on the other table. The words of a song from her youth came to her mind, You stand in the corner, turn away, you're running away again. This was the first line from the Vixen song, reminding Cheryl of how her marriage had progressed. Connie, who frequented this bar often, waved at several guys at the table, and they waved back. One of the guys stood up and walked toward their table. Connie noticed that Cheryl had already stood up and was carefully moving toward the table where the guy was sitting. The man was someone Connie had never seen before. He had dark hair, he was lean but still muscular. He turned his face away from them as if hiding something. He rose smoothly and walked away from the table, heading toward the restroom along the wall near the door. Several guys asked Cheryl to dance as she tried to get to the man who had left the table. They barely slowed her down, one guy even grabbed her arm and tried to drag her onto the dance floor until she screamed for him to let her go. Connie quickly ran up to her friend. Roger, the guy who came over to talk to Connie, joined them. What happened? Connie asked. Cheryl ignored her friend and turned to Roger. That guy at your table, the one who went to the bathroom, is he your friend? How do you know him? She asked. He was nice, honey but maybe he's married or something, Connie said. Don't get attached to any guy before you meet him. Maybe he's not your type, or maybe you're not his. Like you said before, not many people come to places like this to meet their other half. Cheryl ignored Connie again. His name is Rob Thomas, isn't it? Roger nodded. He has been working with us for about two months. He's a hard worker and a great guy, but he lives like a monk. Many girls at work flirt with him all the time, but apparently, he is already in love. This is the first time we were able to get him to come out with us, but something scared him. He returned to her and left. Did you hear that? I scared him. Cheryl said, a tear rolling down her cheek. Connie looked at her friend, and her heart sank. Honey, I don't think you scared him. You're probably just not his type. Handsome guys who know they're handsome always think they can choose the women they want. Maybe he likes blondes. What kind of girlfriend does he have? Cheryl asked. 
Well, she's black and quite broad, Roger chuckled. Connie shrugged, nothing surprised her anymore. Everyone has their own type, honey, just like we do, she said. It also has four chrome wheels, a turbocharged V8 engine, and a running horse in the grill, Roger added. Cheryl looked at Roger in surprise. What? she asked. As far as I can tell, Rob doesn't date girls, he loves his car. The only woman I've ever heard him mention is his mother. That sound a few seconds ago on the street was the sound of his Mustang driving onto the track and leaving me here. If I don't hook up with someone today, I'll have to ask one of the other guys for a ride home. He winked at Connie. Um, looks like I'll be busy trying to calm my friend down, Connie said. But you let me know sometime. Connie took Cheryl to her home. She looked around and noticed several photos of Cheryl and Rob together. What surprised her most was the large, framed wedding photograph. In the photo, Cheryl looked incredibly happy. It seemed she was marrying the man of her dreams and was happy beyond belief. Rob, although younger, also looked very happy. Connie wondered what had happened to turn Cheryl into the depressed and seemingly dying woman she knew. Another thing that bothered Connie was Rob himself. He seemed almost afraid of the woman he had once been married to, the woman he had promised to love and cherish for the rest of his life. She needed to know more about this situation, and not just because of her friendship with Cheryl. The first time she saw Rob across the hall, before he sneaked out the back door of the bar, time stood still for her. Cheryl came out of the bathroom wearing a long flannel robe. She had taken off her makeup, but her face was still red and her eyes puffy from crying. Tears were silently rolling down her cheeks as she sat down on the couch and pulled her knees under her. Connie moved to the couch next to her friend. Why don't you tell me about it, honey, she said. Sometimes it becomes easier when you say it, and I can't help you take revenge on him unless I find out what he did to you. Cheryl stood up for a moment and looked at Connie like she was an idiot. I don't want revenge, Connie. I'm the one who ruined everything. All I want is my husband back. But you're divorced, Connie asked. Didn't you have a chance in court to say no? I would move mountains, Cheryl said. I would sell my soul for another chance. All he has to do is marry me again, but he doesn't even have to do that. I would be happy just to be his girlfriend or his backup option. Connie looked at Cheryl strangely. She was not a woman who would use such language. Don't look at me like I'm crazy, Cheryl said sharply. Rob is not someone who is just looking for a fling. If he started something with me, even something like that, it would still become something more. I just need a way to get back into his life, and even if it was just a night, I would agree to it without hesitation. He is my soulmate, we should be together, she said passionately. Every second we're not together hurts me. Connie looked back at Cheryl. In the last few months that she had known Cheryl, this was the first time she had seen passion for something in her friend's eyes. Seeing Cheryl on the couch without makeup made her seem older but, at the same time, more innocent and vulnerable. Connie knew that Cheryl was approaching 40, but the pain and emotions emanating from her made her look older. Rob and I got married when we were 22, Cheryl began. We met in college and got married right after graduation. I'm from a small farming town in Iowa, and Rob is from New York. Our families and upbringings couldn't be more different, but when we met, something clicked, and that was it. It happened at a party for one of those stupid environmental organizations that every college campus has. We were both there with other people, but it didn't matter. Two minutes after we met, the connection between us became palpable. It was as if electricity was passing between us. Our eyes met, and we simply ignored everyone around us. It got awkward after a while. My boyfriend started getting angry and was making gestures like he wanted to fight Rob or something. Finally, Rob's date saved us from the awkwardness by asking him to take her home. I'm really interested in this event, Rob said, smiling at me but telling his date. Maybe I'll take you home and come back. Perhaps this will be better. The girl said, though I doubt you'll be here alone for long. Can you take me home too? I asked my gentleman. He looked at me like I was dog poop on his shoe. Go to hell, he spat. I'm not a fool, so don't play stupid games with me. Why would I waste gas to take you to your dorm if you're going to come back here and have an intim with another guy? He looked at me angrily. It's good that you disappeared, then. He just walked away, leaving me standing there.
dating Rob was a different experience compared to all the other guys I had met. Even though I hadn't dated that much, I quickly realized that this was different. First of all, that awkward getting to know each other period didn't exist. From the very first moment he returned to the party, he knew that I would be there waiting for him. In fact, before he finally introduced himself to me and we knew each other's names, we already knew it was different. From the very first date, it seemed that we were already married. There was no doubt that there would be no other meetings or acquaintances, no awkward questions about whether we'd become exclusive. We both felt it immediately. There were no more I want to do this with my life, or after I graduate, I'm going to, the rest of our lives would be spent not as me, but as we. We told each other everything that had happened to us up to that moment, our hopes, our dreams, and what we did before. None of this mattered anymore. We bent our separate futures to fit into our new existence together. Our past relationships were as different as our backgrounds. Rob, of course, by the age of 22, already had some experience communicating with the opposite intimate. On the other hand, I had only recently started dating and was determined to remain a virgin until my wedding night. My grandmother was a virgin at her wedding, my mother was too, and I was determined to continue this family tradition. I expected Rob to be a little intimidated at first by my determination. I was even ready to compromise a little in my desire to preserve my virginity before marriage, but Rob told me that if this is what I wanted, good for him, as long as he became the man I married. But you need regular intimate, don't you? I asked him. He just smiled at me and said that the feeling he got from just standing next to me and holding my hand was much better than intim. As is often the case, this laid the foundation for our lives. I loved Rob with all my heart and soul, and he loved me even more. It was as if he was giving me everything he had, and then he went and took even more to give to me too. My life completely changed after that. Although we were both adults and soon to graduate from college when we met, I quickly began to see myself as part of Rob. Several guys I dated found out I was in a relationship and wanted to know more. One guy asked me if I would give him a chance now that someone had broken me. Get what? I asked. Get a little me, he smiled. I don't think that will happen, I said. Besides, you're asking the wrong person. You need to talk to Rob. So we saw everything. My lips were where Rob's kisses were, my breasts were for Rob to play with, my butt was where Rob put his hands when we danced, and, most importantly, my heart was where all of Rob's love went. Life right after college was different. I think in my head, before I met Rob, I always expected to move back home and maybe find a job in one of the larger cities around the small town where I grew up. In the last weeks before graduation, I began to think how difficult it would be to leave him and go home. Everything inside me was twisted. I think that's when I realized that everything we talked about, all the words of love, were real. I couldn't just walk away and leave him for long, just like I couldn't leave my head on the table. It was simply impossible, he was a part of me. I wondered why he didn't worry as much as I did. I foolishly listened to one of my classmates who told me that men are simply different from women, they are not that emotional. She said that where I was emotionally attached to Rob, men were emotionally attached through night, and because we hadn't done that yet, our connection didn't affect him as much as it did me. It seemed logical, just like men could spend the night with someone and just walk away, never calling the girl again. The girls were often devastated, spending weeks wondering what was wrong with them. I decided to talk to Rob and explain to him how I felt. I also wanted to know why he wasn't as worried about our upcoming separation as I was. I got turned on and started to think that maybe Rob was tired of me and wanted a girl he could just sleep with without waiting for the wedding. Looking back, if I had remembered the lesson I learned and turned back then, Rob and I would still be together today. I still remember him lying on his couch studying when I burst into his dorm. Rob, maybe you don't love me as much as you claim, I screamed, in tears. We won't be together after graduation next week and you're just studying like nothing matters. Don't you understand that my life will be terrible without you, even if it's only for a short time? Rob, I love you. I don't want us to ever be apart. He just looked at me like I was the village idiot. Cheryl, we won't be apart, he said calmly. What? I asked, sitting down next to him on the sofa. I was going crazy trying to decide if I should just follow you to Iowa or if you should come to New York with me, he said. 
I looked at all the pros and cons and came to the conclusion that the best thing for us, and perhaps for our children, would be to stay here. My eyes got even bigger. Iowa has small town charm and the best atmosphere for families, he continued, but the job opportunities in both of our fields there are terrible. New York, on the other hand, has all the career prospects you'd expect from a major city, but I wouldn't want to raise a puppy, let alone our kids, in a place like that. So, I decided that the best thing for us would be to just rent an apartment here, move in together, and start looking for work. As soon as we have an income, we can get married. He didn't have time to finish, my brain finally understood what he was talking about, and I just grabbed him and started kissing him. I literally tried to kiss him to death, I didn't even let him breathe. He tried to show me the apartments he had booked for inspection, but nothing could make me let him go. I would have a night with him right there on the dorm couch, with the door wide open, and I wouldn't care who saw us. Why didn't you tell me about this earlier? I finally asked him. I didn't think it was worthy of attention, he replied. We both knew from the very first moment that we would never be apart. Right. I guess sometimes I just need you to remind me, I said, trying to hide my tears. Our first apartment was terrible. In the winter, it was colder than Alaska, and in the summer, it was hotter than hell. There were a lot of strange noises, not enough cabinet space, and too much renovation work, but I loved this place like a palace. Rob found a job in sales the first week out of school. It took me a few weeks, but I finally got a part-time job, which later became full-time. Every penny we could save went toward the wedding or, at least, the honeymoon. I would have just gone to the registry office and married Rob as soon as he asked me, but he reminded me that we would only get married once. We had to do this right. He didn't want me to have regrets or bad feelings later. His family gave us several monetary gifts that helped with the planning and organization of the wedding. Unfortunately, my family couldn't or wouldn't help. I think my parents were upset because I didn't come home after graduation. Actually, I think they thought I got pregnant or something, and that's why I didn't come back. It took a lot of time and visits from both sides for them to finally, reluctantly, accept Rob and that we truly loved each other. The weeks leading up to the wedding were terrible for me. I wanted Rob so badly that I began to regret promising to remain a virgin until marriage. In the last two weeks before the wedding, I started sleeping in Rob's bed. Often, when he hugged me in a dream, I seriously thought about just sleeping with him. There were even a few occasions when he accidentally touched me when he woke up, and I rubbed myself against him while he hugged me. Our wedding night was a turning point for me. We scraped together the money for literally the worst cabin on a cruise ship. It didn't matter because we never saw the deck. I'm so glad we didn't save up more money for a better cabin or fancier meals, it would have been money wasted because we left the cabin three or four times during the ten-day cruise. Rob said I took tonight like a duck takes to water. During these 10 days, I made up for lost time during our honeymoon. We tried everything we could imagine. Over the next few years, we grew closer and closer to each other. We both moved up the career ladder, but we did it on our own terms. We made it clear to our employers that work was important to us, but our marriage was paramount. Rob started in sales and moved into marketing. He probably could have made more money by staying in sales, but that would have meant frequent travel, which we both didn't want. It was the same for me. I worked like a horse. All my bosses claimed I was one of the hardest working employees in the company. The only problem they had with me was that no matter what happened during the workday, when it was time to go home to my husband, I left. There have been times when I was told that if I couldn't stay late after work, I'd probably be fired. Okay, I replied to my manager. I like working here but I can easily find another job. Replacing a husband will be much more difficult, if not impossible. Over time, our assets grew. We moved from one apartment to a better one and finally bought a beautiful house. Under pressure from his mother, Rob and I began to seriously discuss the possibility of having children. Rob joked that my biological clock was ticking so loudly that he could hear it from outside. We planned everything, when I should stop taking birth control pills, when I should quit my job, and even what months I would prefer to be pregnant. We decided to start trying in late summer. There was nothing wrong with our marriage at that time, in fact, it was perfect, too perfect to last, and that was mainly thanks to Rob. 
Have you heard about marriages that become boring over time? Rob didn't let that happen. He always surprised me with small gifts, flowers, or vacations. We always had a few dates throughout the week and took classes together to try new activities and keep the relationship fresh. We took acting lessons one summer just for fun. The following summer, we took up fencing. The summer before it all ended, we tried rock climbing and realized we were both afraid of heights. Our intimate life was magical, but unfortunately, I didn't realize it. I think I started to take Rob and everything he did for me for granted. I worked in an office full of people, mostly women who were much younger than my 36 years. When I told them that I had been married for 14 years, their eyes would roll. I had no stories of showing up to work with a hangover from too much alcohol and sore private parts. I didn't have any comparisons to discuss whether Hardenton was better than a regular meeting at the cleaning station with a man whose name you never learned. I had never lied to get out of a situation where I forgot I was going out with someone because I had two or more guys planned on the same evening. I have never had a night with more than one man at the same time. In fact, one of the secretaries told me that I was intimacy repressed, an anachronism, a relic of the early 20th century. They don't make people like me anymore. I started obsessively thinking about intim with someone other than Rob, and it began to take over most of my everyday thoughts. I mentioned in conversation one day that I was thinking about asking Rob to let me try it, and all the women immediately told me to shut up. Are you out of your mind? They asked. Your husband will never let you do this. Men are like little boys, they all want to keep us locked up, reserving us only for themselves. It doesn't matter if your husband is cheating on the side, which he probably is. You can never let him know that you want to try another man, in his mind, it becomes a competition. Once you do this, you will create a lot of problems for yourself. Don't tell him, just do it, they said. Besides, even if he lets you do it, at some point you will have to give him your turn. Are you ready to let him have another woman, probably younger than you, with a nicer butt and bigger breasts? Every man on earth doesn't want an ordinary woman like you, Cheryl said. My friend Tina pointed to the other side of the office. They all want girls like Molly. Molly was a temporary employee who had just graduated from college. She was 5 feet 10 inches, weighed 115 pounds, had a 22-inch waist, and natural 36 DD breasts. Can you compete with something like that? Tina asked. I shook my head, especially knowing that Molly, although she worked as a model to pay for college, had confided in me that she was looking for a marriage like mine and a husband like Rob. The thought of Rob having a night with her in exchange for my desire to try another man scared me. I could never get him back. That decided everything. The only thing left to do, since I was only going to try it once, was to decide what kind of guy I wanted. They all had their advantages, and I needed to really choose something different. After a few days of thinking, I made up my mind. I think it was partly because of the thoughts of Rob and Molly that I decided that youth and enthusiasm were something worth trying. I ended up dating one of our college interns, David Parker. It took several weeks to build the relationship. I started spending time with him outside of work and finally got to the point where he accidentally touched me. When I make a sound in response to his awkward movement, he did everything to get me into the hotel room. One Wednesday during lunch break, he didn't care if I liked it or not. When we finished, he simply left the room. I lay there feeling cheap and cheated. I cried and had only myself to blame. When I got home, I couldn't look Rob in the eyes. I had to pretend I was sick and go to bed. He did everything he could to make me feel better, trying to take care of me. I felt like dirt. I didn't deserve such a good husband. A few days later, everyone at work found out that I had slept with David. He told everyone he could and even started calling me his married prostitute. A lot of people at work began to stay away from me, and many guys started hitting on me. One of the managers even tried to drag me into the storage room and asked me to please him. I realized that for a while I was untouchable and special. Predators usually avoid faithful married women, but I had moved to the camp of easily accessible girls, and now I had become an accessible target. David continued to press me and demanded that I continue. I refused and told him that I would file an intimate harassment complaint if he mentioned it again. He was young enough that threats, although unfounded, would work. The thing I hated most about David was that he only spoke to me when no one else was around. 
He bragged to all the guys that he had me, but he did this only to improve his reputation. Although I thought he was young and attractive and it flattered my ego that I could still have an affair with someone who had just turned 20, he saw things differently. He didn't think I was attractive, just an easy target. Besides that, he was embarrassed that people might think he was interested in someone as old as me. He once even told me that I was only a couple of years younger than his mother, of course, the same woman who helped me decide to do it the first time. Tina reminded me that I got involved with Rob when we were both young. Maybe I needed a caring, gentle older man with even more intimate experience than Rob, someone who would also play it safe because he would have nothing to lose, just like me. Normally, I would never have thought about this, but they put so much pressure on me to do something to get over the experience with David that I started to give in. They also made it clear that I had been acting differently since I slept with David, and if I had kept it up, Rob might have noticed a change. Neither of us knew it, but Rob was no fool. We had been together too long for him not to recognize me. He knew something was wrong from the very first day I returned home sick. He didn't know exactly what I had done, but his radar was on. I met Henry on the internet. I was actually looking for an older man to have a night with, and he seemed perfect. His wife was dying in the hospital, her illness dragged on, and he hadn't had an intim in years and missed it. He sought out secret relationships to occasionally satisfy his desires. I felt so sorry for him that I cried. It seemed to me that it was almost my duty to help this poor man in his pain. I felt even sadder after our first time, it took several hours for him. I think the saddest moment was when I found out that the whole story about his sick wife was a lie. He was just a fraud. He wanted more intimate than his wife could give him, even though he couldn't get aroused himself. When I left the motel, I realized that this scoundrel had even stolen all the cash from my wallet. I had to leave my bag, ID, and cell phone with the motel manager so I could go to the ATM and withdraw money to pay for the room. I couldn't afford for Rob to see the motel bill on his credit card statement. As bad as I felt then, it became even worse when I returned home. I took a shower. Rob and I had a night fairly regularly, usually four to five nights a week. The problem wasn't our intim, it was my head. Apparently, I was already beginning to take him for granted, and I vowed that I would never make that mistake again. It took several days before Rob fully recovered from his cold and returned to our bed. He was still too tired, and I was literally going crazy. Another problem was that he was still afraid he might be contagious, so he didn't want to hug me. The women at work were still putting pressure on me, they were now sure that it was not a matter of age. I told them I vowed not to cheat again, but they reminded me that I had already done it twice, and it hadn't hurt my marriage. It's better to get it out of your system and then have children in peace and live the rest of your life without regrets, like wishing you had done this or that. Since Rob was still unwell and I gave in. We left work early and went to a bar they knew about, so I could meet a few guys and still get home in time without Rob noticing. I really thought I was protecting Rob the way he always protected me. After all, I tried not to let him know how much I suffered and wanted to try it. To my surprise, a few minutes after we arrived, a guy named Greg, whom several of my work friends knew, came to our table. It turned out that Greg knew several of them very well. He explained that he was only into no-strings-attached relationships. He seemed a bit of a gigolo to me, but to be honest, I would never have fallen in love with him anyway. He was too self-confident and arrogant. I took his phone number so we could meet and finish this matter. After being tricked by Henry at the motel, I decided to satisfy my latest curiosity on my own turf. I took the next day off and called Greg for an early afternoon visit. He arrived around 1 p.m., which I thought would give me about four hours with him before I needed to change the bed sheets, air out the house, and get myself ready for Rob. We had rough night all over the house. Then I heard applause behind me. Greg and I turned our heads at the same time. He was too exhausted to move, and I was crushed by his weight. I almost fainted, realizing that I was in more serious trouble than I had ever been in my life. Hey, man, Greg began. Don't say a word. Rob warned. I'll just pack my things and leave, but if you open your mouth, I swear I will kill you. She came to me herself. This is not my, Greg began stupidly. To this day, I still don't understand why he spoke. Rob said he was leaving and that Greg should just keep quiet, but Greg absolutely had to open his mouth. 
Although Greg was physically larger than Rob, he could not match the rage that simmered within him. Greg was exhausted from pounding me for almost 15 minutes, while a wave of adrenaline and pure hatred was seething inside Rob. Rob grabbed Greg by the neck in one of his arms and pulled him away from me. Greg screamed and started begging Rob, but it didn't help. Rob's right hand struck Greg in the face quickly and hard several times while his left hand held him in place. He then slammed Greg's head hard onto the floor and dragged him down the wooden steps by one leg. He simply opened the door and threw an unconscious Greg onto our lawn. I expected Rob to turn around, rush back upstairs, and start yelling at me or hit me, but he didn't. He just looked at me for a long time. I felt the weight of every tear that flowed down his cheeks as he looked at me. Then he simply turned around and left the house. My brain refused to work. I just stood there. After a few minutes, I realized that he was probably outside still beating Greg. I needed to be prepared to beg him not to leave. He said he was going to take his things and leave. I ran back to the bedroom and stood in front of his dresser. I wouldn't let him take anything from this house unless he took me with him. I waited there for several long minutes, my back pressed against his dresser. I had to do whatever he wanted so that he wouldn't leave me. I knew he would never hurt me, so I felt safe trying to stop him from taking his things and leaving. But I also felt like the stupidest woman in the world because I knew that no matter what I did, our relationship would never be the same again. I've read stories about marriages where there was betrayal, about half of them ended in divorce. This couldn't happen to us. I loved Rob too much for that. After some time, I began to wonder why he had been gone for so long. I went downstairs and noticed that Greg was just starting to come to his senses. Rob's car was missing. He didn't take anything, he didn't pack his things. He just left. He walked out of my life without a word. Damn it! He had to come back and get his things so we could talk. Greg began to crawl toward the house. When he reached the porch, I slammed the door in his face. He stood on my porch in the middle of the day, completely without clothes. I would never let him back into the house. What if Rob came back and saw him inside? Rob might think I was on Greg's side, but I didn't worry for long. The police arrived a few minutes later. They sat Greg down on my porch and called an ambulance. Then they knocked on my door. There were no cars in the yard, and I thought that if I just pretended that no one was home, maybe they would leave. But then I realized that I had to do something to ensure that Greg's and my versions didn't diverge. I knew Greg had as much to lose as I did, he was married like me, which explained his no-strings-attached policy. I opened the door and started screaming. I'm so glad you're here, officers. I said. I saw that poor guy being attacked and his clothes stolen. I was afraid to open the door, I was afraid that the criminals might still be nearby. Can you describe them? asked one of the officers. No way, I said. They will come back and take revenge on me. My name is West. Leave me alone. There were four of them, Greg croaked. Big bikers. After they took my money, they just took off all my clothes for fun. Ma'am, are you sure you don't want to say anything? Asked the officer. If no one comes forward, these guys may never be caught. I have nothing to say, I replied. I hope you can sleep tonight, lady, the second cop said. I hope someday something happens that ruins your life, and you wish someone would intervene to prevent it. Trust me, officer, I said, barely holding back tears. After what happened today, I don't think I'll ever be able to sleep peacefully again. My life is not at all as rosy as you think. After they left, I collected all of Greg's clothes, his phone, and his car keys. I was sure that sooner or later he would return for them, he would need his documents and phone, and probably his car key. I just sat in the kitchen, wearing only a silk robe, which I had thrown on before opening the door to the police. I didn't cry or move, I just listened to the ticking of the clock. The phone rang, and I jumped up to see who was calling. I was hoping it was Rob, but it was Tina from work. I let the phone go to voicemail. Five minutes later, the phone rang again. I jumped up again, hoping it was Rob, but again it was Tina. Hello, Tina, I said tiredly. Please don't call me again today. I'm not in the mood to talk. This is not just a friendly call, she said. 
I'm trying to help you and Greg with damage control. Do you have all his clothes, phone, wallet, and car keys? I have his clothes, phone, and car keys, I said. I didn't find my wallet, it's probably in his pants. Great! I'll pick it up in a few minutes, she said. As soon as Greg has the phone, you can call tomorrow to coordinate your stories. Greg's wife is working late today. We're going to tell her that he was robbed by bikers, the same story you told the police. You can discuss together what was done to him and what they looked like. You may both have to testify. We have to protect Greg's marriage. I'll throw his stuff out on the lawn as soon as I finish talking to you, I said sharply. I don't need to talk to him because I don't care about his marriage. Cheryl, what's wrong with you, she asked. What about my marriage? I screamed. Who's going to try to save my marriage? I started crying. What are you talking about, she asked. I'll be right there, she said, and hung up. A few minutes later, Tina drove up to my house. She knocked on the door, and I opened it to give her Greg's clothes and keys. What's happened, she asked. I told her the whole story. She was shocked. Did your husband beat Greg like that? She asked. I nodded. He still hasn't come home, I said. I don't know what to do. We were never apart. I'm still trying to wrap my head around the fact that your sweet little hubby beat up Greg. Did he take a lot of his stuff when he left? No, I replied. He just left the house. Then you need to stay home for a few days, she said. If he's really that mad at you, he doesn't want to see you. He'll try to get his things while you're at work. That's probably what he'll do, I said. Why do you care, she asked. You yourself wanted to replace him, didn't you? I mean, you've been cheating on him for the past few weeks because you wanted to try something new. This usually happens when a woman either wants to end her marriage or suspects that her husband is cheating on her. So which of these is true? Neither. I replied. Rob will never cheat on me, just like I will never cheat on him. I can't replace him, he's perfect for me. In fact, I realized this right before I started this whole Greg thing. Cheryl, why were you sleeping with other men then? She asked. Because, whether you like it or not, honey, that's exactly what you did. You cheated on your husband. But I was only listening to you. I screamed. The only man I've ever been with is Rob. You all talked about variety, trying new things, and different guys. It made me feel old and boring. Cheryl, why do you think we go to clubs and bars all the time? She asked me. Because it's fun and exciting, I said. No, she said sadly. We do this because it's better than coming home to an empty apartment alone. Ask any girl who does this, we are all looking for someone who will love us and take care of us always. We want someone who won't judge us or just have us and leave us, and who won't cheat on us. We are all looking for someone to love us like you do, and I bet every woman you've talked to in the office is just jealous of what you have. That's why we all hate that girl Molly. She is the only one who admits what she wants, so we're all trying to pretend we're okay with what we're doing. But I bet any of those women would gladly trade places with you. Oh no, I said, realizing what I had done. Do you know how many times I went home with some guy, let him have me, and pretended the terrible night was good only for him to then take me to a party? She asked, and when is intimate truly great? It's when the other person is really trying to please you because they love you, I replied. She shook her head. Most of the time, you realize that they don't care about you. They will only call you as long as you agree to whatever they want. Even then, as soon as a guy gets bored with you or tired of having a night with you, he leaves, unless you do something wilder. At first, they just want you so badly that they will do anything to get it. She spoke as if she had been through it herself. Once they get it, the power shifts. You have to keep giving to them to keep them. Trust me, every one of those women in the office was always jealous of you. I started crying even louder. Hey, she said, it might not be as bad as you think. If he loves you as much as you've always said he does, maybe he'll forgive you. But whatever you do, be here when he comes back for his things. Call all his friends and find him, but never stop fighting for him. Never give up. You'll never find love like this again. 
While we were talking, she was going through Greg's clothes but couldn't find his wallet. She asked me to return it when I found it. The next morning, I called work again and said I was sick. I put on Rob's favorite outfit and started cooking his favorite dish. Then I sat down at the kitchen table and waited. By lunchtime, he still did not call or return home. I made a list of all of Rob's friends and started calling them. Nobody had seen him. I called his work and was told that Rob was taking the day off. In desperation, I finally called his mom. She hadn't heard from him either. I checked our bank accounts and found good news. Rob did not withdraw money from the accounts or close them. He didn't even use his credit card for the hotel yesterday or today. My heart ached, my head ached, my soul ached, but all I could do was wait. I finally called the police and filed a missing person report. They asked me some stupid questions and said they would get back to me. They thought Rob might have run off with another woman, and if so, he had a right to do so. I could divorce him for abandonment if he was gone for a certain amount of time. They said they would contact me if there were any leads and hung up. That night, I fell asleep on the couch out of pure exhaustion. As soon as I woke up, I ran around the house to see if anything had changed or if he was here. The next morning, I called all of Rob's friends again, again, no one had heard from him. Finally, when I reached one of Rob's best friends, Danny Ames, I got a reaction. This time, I didn't talk to Danny because he was at work, I talked to his wife. If I had spoken to Danny, I probably would have gotten the same reaction as yesterday, but women are different. We haven't seen him, she said. Her voice was very tense and harsh. Something clicked in my head. Are you sure? I asked. Obviously, this was the last straw, and she revealed everything that was in her soul. Rob is one of the nicest guys I know, she snapped. Why don't you just leave him alone, you? You've already caused him so much pain that he's going to leave town. Can't you just leave him alone? You literally destroyed this man. He quit his job and is now homeless. He left you everything he had, but you also had to twist the knife and poke him in the face. No wonder so many men just hate women. Alike you ruins our lives. Then she became silent and was breathing so loudly that I could hear it through the phone. Cheryl, can I ask you a question? She asked. How does it feel to know that you broke the heart of someone who loved you selflessly? I saw you two together. Remember we had barbecues and parties together? I know how he treated you. How does it feel to know that someone loved you so much and you just took their heart in your hands and crushed it? Are you feeling good now? Apparently not, because you're still trying to torture him. Cheryl, just leave him alone. You won, you completely destroyed him. He will never be the same, so just leave him alone. If you ever loved him in all the time you were married, just leave him alone. Then she hung up so hard that my ears were ringing. For a while, I couldn't help myself, I started crying again. Why doesn't anyone see that I'm in pain too? I loved Rob as much as he loved me, and I knew it was my fault that we ended up in this situation. I was dying inside, but no one cared. Maybe two hours later, the phone rang. I didn't recognize the number. Hello? I said in a wooden voice. Where should I send his things? Shouted the indignant woman. At first, I thought she was talking about Rob. I told Greg the last time he tried to pull this that if he cheated on me again, it was over between us. Now he is completely yours, homewrecker. As soon as I find out where you live, I will beat you to a pulp. But first, I'll show you a photo. I want to see if you're so insensitive that you don't care that the man you're cheating with has three small children who depend on him. How could he do this to his children? Alike you probably doesn't have children. You just want to have a night with whoever you want, and there are no consequences. You just destroyed our family, so I hope you feel really good now. Then she hung up. I didn't understand why she blamed me. I didn't know Greg had children. Hell. I barely knew he was married. He made it seem like he and his wife were going to get a divorce. I think they'll probably actually get divorced now. I felt sorry for the children, but as cold as it may sound, this is Greg's problem and his responsibility, not mine. My problem was to get Rob back, and I was willing to do whatever it took to achieve that. I decided to go to Danny's house and talk to Angie. 
She might want to beat me up, and I'd let her do it if she told me anything about Rob, but she was the only person I knew who admitted to seeing him in the last two days. I was torn between going to Angie's and what if Rob came home and got his things while I was gone. I called Angie and begged her to come and talk to me. I pleaded with her, for the sake of all the time we'd known each other, to at least let me speak. If she didn't like what I had to say, she could just leave. If she could figure out that I just made a mistake, maybe she'd tell me what she knows. She said she would think about coming but didn't think it was a good idea. She said she was afraid that if she saw me, she might beat me up, so maybe we should talk on the phone. Then she added that perhaps she would come after all, or just call back, or maybe she would do neither. I felt like she had to call someone to make a decision. I didn't know if she wanted to call Rob or Danny, but I hoped she would tell me something. I dozed off again sitting at the kitchen table. A knock on the door woke me up. I looked out the window and saw a woman standing on my back porch. I walked around the house when I didn't see anyone in front. Are you Cheryl Thomas? She asked joyfully. Yes, I replied. I thought that these sales companies were probably starting to buy identities and information about potential clients just like they do on the internet. She handed me a stack of papers, and I reflexively accepted them. It's been handed to you, she smiled even wider. Have a nice day, ma'am, and don't forget to spay or neuter your pet. There should be a law against what that little idiot did to me. I hadn't eaten anything for the last three days. I became depressed and could barely hold on. When I looked at the papers she handed me and read them, I fell into even greater shock and collapsed on the floor. The heading at the top of the papers read claim for dissolution of marriage. As I fell to the floor, I remembered my eyes focusing on her tight, firm little fifth place that swayed flirtatiously from side to side as she walked away from me. This was actually reading another stack of papers as she walked. Is this really her damn job? She just ruins one marriage after another all day and then goes home to have dinner. Maybe one day she'll have to serve her own husband with divorce papers. I wanted to kill this, but I realized that she didn't destroy my marriage. I did. But I was determined to save him. I thought I had good relations with my neighbors. At least, that's what I thought. I don't know how long I lay curled up in the doorway holding those damn papers, but when I came to, I noticed that my neighbor, Mr. Smithers, was mowing his lawn. I was lying there curled up in the doorway in full view of everyone, and he was just cutting his damn grass. Maybe he thought that either debauchery or stupidity was contagious. Maybe he thought that after what I'd done, I should just lie there and rot. I also noticed that my phone was ringing. I picked it up and said, Hello? I was sure it was Angie, but it was a man. Good morning, Mrs. Thomas, or whatever you want to call yourself, he said. I would like to make arrangements to come and pick up the papers and my check. I'm tired of people acting like I know what's going on. Who are you? I asked coldly. Forgive me, he said. I'm Oscar Goldman. I am representing your ex-husband in a divorce case. According to our agreement, I must come and pick up the papers and check from you. In a few months, everything will be finished and decided. Wait, Perry Mason. I growled. I'm not a lawyer, but I know that's not how it works. I should hire a lawyer too. We then set up meetings to discuss whether both parties want a divorce and whether we can go to counseling. Then, if we can't resolve our differences, we schedule more meetings to discuss the division of property, blah, blah, blah. But believe me, there will be no divorce here. No ma'am, he replied sharply. In our state, if you are married without children, you can get a no-contest divorce in 90 days if there are no issues regarding property or child support. I do this for a flat fee of $189. My client assures me that this is one of those cases. I assume you have already received the papers and have seen his proposed agreement. First of all, I haven't had a chance to look at your damn papers yet. I screamed into the phone. And secondly, this divorce will definitely be contested. I will never agree to divorce him, and whatever he tries to use to buy me out of our marriage won't work. Everyone has their price, I hissed. He smiled. Which one is yours? I have no price, I said. Stop. I changed my mind. Yes, I have a price. I will give him a divorce if he gives me what I want more than anything in the world. What is this? He asked. 
I want my husband back, I said, and then I finally hung up. I wasn't an idiot. I looked through the papers and started crying again. Rob gave me everything except the car he drove away in and the clothes he was wearing. He even offered to return the car when he got to where he was going. I had my own car, why would he think that I needed his? In addition, it was obvious that Rob just wanted to get away from me. He was ready to just leave, and he left. I still had the house, all of our money, which was mostly his, all of our investments, even his clothes and personal items. He gave me everything he had just to get rid of me. He didn't even tell anyone what I did, he just wanted freedom. But I loved him too much to give it to him. Almost a month later, despite the fact that I hired a lawyer and tried to challenge the divorce, the judge approved it. He wondered what I had done to Rob to make him literally just walk out of the house and leave me everything he had worked for over the last 15 years to get away from me. My lawyer immediately raised the issue that Rob was making significantly more money than I was, so there had to be some kind of alimony agreement. The judge thought it was my idea, so he approached me. Woman, when this man left this state, he was homeless. As far as I understand, he quit his job and left you everything he had, even his clothes. What else can you take from him? Do you want me to put him in jail too? God, I wish this judge could put Rob in jail. I would have been there with him right away. I would talk to him every day until he forgave me. Your Honor, my client has not had the opportunity to even briefly speak with her husband since he left her. Usually, a meeting is envisaged between the offended spouses to resolve issues, my lawyer said. Lawyer, you read too many damn internet stories about divorce. There is no law or statute that provides for this. All documents have been submitted correctly. Divorce granted. If I had any say in the matter, I would have changed the property division to the standard 50 50ths but this poor guy just wanted to walk away with the rest of his dignity. Let's leave it to him. The divorce will be finalized in 60 days. Next, he hit his gavel, looked at me, and shook his head. I was sure he muttered under his breath. He then called the next case. I quit my job. I couldn't work there anymore. Every guy thought I was an easy target and desperate, and all the women thought I was stupid. I stayed home for a while, living off our savings. I used some of our investments to pay off my mortgage and refinance it so I could afford a house on my own. I tried to improve relations with some of our friends, but no one wanted to be friends with me. Apparently, rumors quickly spread about what I had done, how I destroyed two families and deprived three small children of their father. I also humiliated Rob, who everyone thought was a decent person and who didn't deserve what happened to him. It seemed like no one cared about my pain. About a month after our divorce was finalized, Greg showed up. He was drunk and wanted into him. He said I owed him because he didn't tell anyone that it was Rob who ruined his face. I tried to close the door on him, but he put his foot in it to hold it open. I snapped the chain shut and ran to the kitchen to grab the biggest knife I could find. When he reached through the door to try to remove the chain, I cut him with a small cut, and he knew I was serious. He looked at me in surprise. I think he thought I was playing some kind of game. But I hated that stupid. You'll never have me again, I said. He chuckled. Oh, look, my husband is arriving. Greg looked back, and it seemed to me that fear showed on his face. He didn't want to deal with Rob again. He ran away, and I never saw him again. Over the past few months, I began to rebuild my relationship with Rob's mom. She always considered me a daughter, and I think I convinced her that I loved her son more than life itself. She knows that I made a colossal mistake that I may never be able to correct. She has forgiven me and sometimes reads cards and emails from him to me, but she will not take my side or try to help me contact him. She didn't even tell me he was back in this state. There will never be another man for me, that's for sure. That's why I didn't go out to bars with you anymore. Even tonight, as I said, my intention was just to have a drink and go home. I went because I really couldn't stand being alone today. That's probably why Rob came out tonight too. Connie looked into Cheryl's eyes and noticed tears flowing down her friend's cheeks again in fresh streams. Something made her very upset. What's so bad about tonight? Connie asked. Today would have been our anniversary, Cheryl replied, crying. Well then, tonight is a great time to start, isn't it? Connie asked. 
Star what? Cheryl asked through her tears. Our plan is to get him back, Connie said. Are you still talking about some kind of retribution? Cheryl asked. Why should you take revenge? He didn't do anything wrong, did he? To be honest, you did, Connie said. But when I talked about coming back, I meant the two of you reuniting. Are you serious? Cheryl asked, perking up. Sure, seriously, Connie said. I know it seems impossible, but it's actually not that hard. Cheryl looked at Connie strangely. Why do you think so? She asked. Because you both still love each other, Connie said. That kind of love is very difficult to find, so that must mean something. It may take some time, and we will have setbacks and mistakes along the way. But if you are willing to commit yourself fully to it, we can do it. I will do whatever it takes to get Rob back, Cheryl said. Okay then, we need to start planning, Connie said. What does he think about what happened between you? I don't know, Cheryl said. I haven't spoken to him since he caught me. He just disappeared, and no one said anything to me. Even the people who knew where he was didn't tell me anything. When I saw him tonight, it was the first time I've seen him since this happened. No wonder you're so upset, Connie said. I didn't even know he was back in town, let alone that he was working somewhere nearby. I don't know anything else about him, Cheryl said. Well, except for one thing. And what is that? Connie asked. That there is one woman who will love him until the last day of her life, Cheryl said. No matter what. Sorry, honey, Connie said, but this doesn't help us. We need specific information about what he is like now. This experience with you has probably changed him. Did you notice anything different about him? Well, he seems more muscular, Cheryl said. And he seems less open, less trusting than before. He just seems sadder. What did you expect? Connie asked. Sweetheart, if he loved you as much as you say, what you did to him probably made him feel like you ripped his heart out of his chest with a shovel and handed it to him. He won't trust anyone easily, especially a woman, and especially not you. He will probably do anything to avoid having to feel that way again. So it will be very difficult. But not impossible, right? Cheryl asked, with a hint of desperation in her voice. Why do you want to do this? Connie asked, changing the subject. Do you want this for yourself? Do you need to get him back to regain what you once had, or do you just like the way he is intimate with you? Why is this so important to you? Because I love him, and without him I'm nothing, Cheryl said. My life hasn't felt like life since he left. It's just a mechanical existence until I can die. You can't get it from another man, Connie said. There are a lot of men out there, and a lot of women who are looking for someone to love. Can't you just go looking like the rest of us? I tried with other men, Cheryl replied sharply. And it's not just about Intim. No other man I've met makes me feel the way Rob does. My stupid decision to try other men wasn't because I didn't like Rob or that I was tired of him. I just wanted to understand what those stupid women in my old office were talking about. If I had known that it would cost me my marriage, I would never have taken the risk. I would have remained curious for the rest of my life. Okay, but I have to warn you, this will probably be painful for both of you, Connie said. If you love him as much as you say you do, how can you be willing to put him through all the pain that would cause? She looked at Cheryl. I mean, if you love someone that much, why make them suffer? Because he's already suffering just like me, Cheryl said. At least this way you will have an end to his suffering and a light at the end of the tunnel where we will be together again and ultimately happy. If we don't do this together, I'm not sure either of us will last much longer. Okay, I'll start on Monday, Connie said. All her questions convinced her that they were doing this for the right reasons. What will you start? Cheryl asked excitedly. The first thing we need to do is get close to him. Luckily, I know his buddy Roger from the bar. I'll go to his work on Monday morning and ask him to introduce me to Rob. I'll get Rob to agree to talk to me when he feels comfortable in my presence. I will try to find out how he feels about you. Then I will gradually convey information about you and how you feel to him. Our goal is for him to eventually agree to talk to you. When we achieve this, we will see what to do next. Sounds great, Cheryl said enthusiastically. 
Then her expression changed. What do you get out of this? She asked. I'm a firm believer that what goes around comes around, Connie said. Until now in my life, I have had a lot of fun. But lately, this has become my problem. I've reached the point where I don't want to be that fun girl anymore. I want something like what you had. So maybe if I help you find your true love again, someday someone will help you find mine. Connie spent Saturday trying on different outfits in front of the mirror at home. She had to be very careful in how she approached Rob. It would be very different from every other man she had ever chased. Connie knew her strengths and weaknesses from her teenage years and knew how to maximize some and minimize others. Usually, her plan was to wear a tight skirt and a low-cut blouse and frequently bend over in front of the guy. It usually worked, but Rob wasn't a ladies' man and he was already badly hurt, so a direct approach wouldn't work, it would probably only scare him. Early Monday morning, she took a shower and applied a light floral scent. She didn't want her fragrance to overwhelm him. She wore shapewear because she knew she had a little extra around her waist. She chose a beautiful dress that, although it wasn't low-cut, still showed off her deep cleavage, making it clear to anyone who looked that she had impressive breasts underneath. She drove to Roger in Rob's office. When she saw Roger, he smiled and waved at her. I've never seen you covered up like that, baby, Roger said. Were you so desperate to see me that you couldn't wait for the next time I showed up at the bar? Roger, honey, Connie drawled, remember that thing you always wanted so much? You mean that thick round thing you're sitting on? He grinned. Roger was instantly awake and excited. Ah, Connie said. If you do me a favor, I can't promise you'll get it, but it will get you a lot closer to me. Considering it, he said, who do I need to kill? Do you remember my friend from the other night? She asked. Which one? There were three of them at your table, Roger replied. The brunette, she began. Oh damn. Wasn't she the one who was depressed all the time, crying and so hysterical that you had to take her home and prevent me from having any fun? He asked. Yes, that's her, Connie said in a gentle voice. Okay, I'll kill this, Roger snapped. Damn it. She probably wants to get killed herself. She looks so damn miserable. Roger, I don't want you to kill her, Connie began. There's no chance I'll sleep with her, Roger said sharply. There is no benefit in such situations. All these depressed women are too depressed to enjoy night. Listen, Belmas, Connie interrupted, you couldn't get her into bed even if you wanted to, and I don't want you to do this. Don't you remember? She was married to your friend Rob. Damn it! Roger exclaimed. No wonder the poor guy doesn't want to deal with women. I tried to set him up with someone a couple of times, but he simply ignored them. Then the girls got angry at me. He's probably pretty cute or whatever women like, but as soon as I introduce him to some girl, he just won't talk to her. He acts like it's Friday night. As soon as you approached our table, he immediately disappeared. Roger made a sound like the howling wind, which he thought was funny, but it just made Connie look at him strangely. Well, they weren't always like this, Connie said. They were very much in love with each other for a long time until something ruined everything and they got divorced. Now they are both unhappy without each other, and I intend to bring them together again. Good luck with that, Roger chuckled. I need you to introduce me to him and stay with us until he starts talking to me, Connie said. Then I can handle it myself. Oh, so you want your friend's man? You seem to be quite the scandalous girl, he replied. Well, I don't care, as long as I get mine. I'm ready for a threesome if you're interested. He grinned. Just do me this favor, please, Connie said, smiling. She thought about what Cheryl had told her, especially the things that pertain to her and Rob's relationship. Connie made several decisions about her own life. The first was that she was really tired of being the fun girl everyone had and then left alone while they went back to their wives and girlfriends. It was time to find her own partner. She was completely honest with Cheryl about this. It was also true that Connie really wanted to help Cheryl get Rob back. She sincerely wanted to see Cheryl happy, although she doubted that this was possible. The look in Rob's eyes was even worse than Cheryl's, it seemed that his soul was wounded. Connie didn't believe he would ever take back the woman who did this to him. If he did, great for Cheryl, but if he didn't, Connie wouldn't mind if Rob ended up in her bed one day. 
Roger took her hand and led her down the corridor. He knocked once on the office door and entered. The man in the office was talking on the phone. He turned to look at them while still talking into the phone. He nodded to Roger and looked at Connie appraisingly. His face showed no emotion as he assessed her. What happened, Rog? Rob asked when he hung up. Yeah, nothing special, bro, Roger said. This concerns your noisy gasoline victim. Be careful about insulting the love of my life. Rob smiled, his tone suggesting he was joking when he called the car the love of his life, but Connie wasn't sure he was joking. Anyway, Rob, do you remember that Friday night I finally talked you into going to the bar with us? Rob nodded, and Connie noticed his face and shoulders tense at the memory. I brought Connie to talk to you about your religion, and you just disappeared, Roger said. Connie saw Rob replaying this moment in his head. The tension in his body was so strong that she thought he might break. She needed to somehow defuse the situation. I hope I didn't do anything to scare you, she said. No, it's not about you, Rob replied in a wooden voice. It was someone else. Even as he said someone else, Connie saw that his consciousness seemed to have turned off. The thought of Cheryl caused him so much pain that he appeared to lose touch with reality. Connie began to wonder if he hated Cheryl that much, or if he still loved her so deeply that not having her around hurt him so much. Anyway, Connie wants to join your, well, religion, Roger said suddenly. Connie realized how smart Roger really was, it was perfect. He gave her a great way into Rob's life. I really want to buy one, she said with delight, but I've only seen them from afar, and I don't know anything about how to own such a car. For example, what kind of maintenance needs to be done? I have thousands of questions. Connie noticed that Rob's gaze on her had become softer. When she first walked in, Rob looked at her as if Roger had brought fresh poop and placed it on his desk. Now he looked at her as if he were wondering what she would look like in a Mustang. I have too many questions to bother you while you're working. Maybe we can meet somewhere later? She took the notepad from his desk and wrote down her home and mobile numbers so he could call her later. If you call me on my mobile, I will be in touch at any time, she added. She and Roger walked toward the door. Connie, standing in the doorway, turned around and said to Rob, I promise there will be no one else, just you and me in your car, of course. Then she and Roger closed the door, leaving Rob alone with his thoughts. As soon as Connie and Roger closed the door, Roger noticed that there was no one in the hallway. He took the moment to grab Connie's buttocks. Well, how did I cope? He asked. I have to admit, it was very clever, she said. So, I'm entitled to something? He asked. I said I'd think about it, she began. Connie nodded and smiled. She patted Roger on the shoulder. Then you need to convince him to call me, don't you? She said knowing that she would never have any intimate relations with him again. She kept thinking about what she had learned about Rob and Cheryl when they met in their twenties. He was already intimacy active but had put it on hold for her. He didn't make an issue of it or complain because, as important as night was, Cheryl was more important to him. It was like her mother had once said many years ago, if a man really loves you, he will wait. All men ever wanted from Connie was intimate, if they didn't get it, they moved on to another woman. When they did get it, they still ended up leaving. She was just a body to them, and Roger saw only that in her. There couldn't be a future between them, so why waste time on it? There was one more thing she had never noticed before, jealousy. Rob loved Cheryl so much that seeing her with another man destroyed him. This drove him to the point of violence, almost killing a man and causing him to leave his life, his fear of marriage, and everything he had. The thought of sharing someone he loved so much drove him crazy. As she saw, he was still suffering from it. Roger didn't care who slept with Connie, he was ready to share her and even be one of the five if only he received a share. If he cared even a little about her, he wouldn't be able to do this. Connie suddenly realized that many of the things she thought about men were probably wrong, and even more, she decided that she needed a man like Rob. Connie left Roger in Rob's office and headed straight to her job. She sat down at her desk and looked through her incoming documents to see what was urgent. She picked up a piece of paper and waved to her boss across the room. He waved back. She had called him in advance to warn him that she would be late, so he just nodded. 
He wasn't as strict with her as he was with the rest of the staff because she pleased him from time to time when he needed it. She pretended to look for the number on the piece of paper in her hands and dialed it on her phone. When the other end of the line answered, she started talking. Cheryl, how are you feeling, dear? She asked. I'm not feeling well enough to go to work today, but I'm feeling better, Cheryl replied. At least I have hope now. Oh honey, you have even more than that, Connie said. Meet me in the park near work for lunch. Bring me something nice because I skipped breakfast for you. Okay, I'll be there, Cheryl said and hung up. Connie waited impatiently for Cheryl in the small park nearby, where several mothers with small children walked unsteadily and rushed around the playground and sandbox. A few minutes later, she saw Cheryl walking toward her with a couple of packed lunches from a nearby cafe. Cheryl looked nervous as she placed the boxes on the bench. Connie opened one and began to eat a sandwich that contained many different deli meats. Well? Cheryl asked. What got you so excited? Have you come up with something that will help our plan? Oh, much better than that, Connie said. She took a can of Pepsi from the box and opened it. Well, tell me, Cheryl insisted. Okay, Connie said, pretending it didn't matter. I talked to Rob today. I gave him my phone numbers, and I hope that he will call me soon so that we can meet and talk. Cheryl was shocked. She sat down on the bench and did not move for a long time, and then her face broke into a smile. How is he? What did he say? Did he mention me? Did you mention me? Does he hate me? Where was he? How long has he been back in town? She asked, firing off all the questions in a hurry without stopping to take a breath. He's okay, Connie said slowly. He didn't mention you. When I hinted about you, a shadow passed over his face. He was very tense when he thought about you. This is bad, isn't it? Cheryl asked. That means he hates me. Then the tears began to fall. Cheryl, it's too early to judge. We don't know what this means. Maybe it just means he's still upset because he loved you so much, Connie said. We need to give this a little time. Just as Cheryl was ready to ask another round of questions, Connie's phone rang. What do you think of our first part of the story? My impression is that peer pressure was set up to get the protagonist's wife to do what she did. What's your impression? Write in the comments. Till new videos.